Beta. 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 Hi everybody, welcome to Lazy Devs Academy. Welcome to our regular program of Lazy Devs Academy. Today we are going to be looking at 0.01i. <sighs> okay, so it's 0.2.0i. I'm sorry, I'm not good with numbers. The new version of Pico 8, it is now the beta version, which means Pico 8, the development of Pico 8 is moving on to a completely new stage of its development where most of the features are starting to settle in and we are just about you know fixing stuff and, and, and optimizing it. I'm very excited about this. I've been watching the release of this version over the last couple of days. It has been a kind of like a slow rollout. As you can see, I, we are currently at the version I, it started with A, B, C and so forth and we arrived at I. There have been a lot of like incremental updates and bug fixes happening over the time because there's a lot of features that are new to this. And uh, yeah, they've been fixed over time. Uh, I waited and basically until uh, Zep from Lexalawful posted a forum post. Because once the forum post is up, you know that you know things are are stabilizing slowly. And there's still a couple of things that I don't think are quite right yet. So yeah, let's dig into all of the features. As always, I will go through the new features described in the forum posts, um, but also all, all the way down here uh, at the change log. There's a change log here for all the different versions, and I actually went through the change logs, you know, with a fine comb and and uh, picked out the changes that are actually interesting that maybe haven't been mentioned in the forum post. Uh, short disclaimer: If you hear a very excited baby outside, or maybe some kind of post-apocalyptic um, storm sound effects, that's be because we are in a very unusual situation today here in in China, in Fuzhou, China. <laughs> Sorry guys, I'm doing my best. Hi. Yes. Anyways, first feature. So if you press escape, you will see that there's not much change in the general UI kind of stuff. But in this part in the sprite editor, you see there is a new button down here. <gasps> and that new button is something that I'm kind of shocked that we've survived this long without this. This is a shape drawing tool that you might be familiar from you know various paint programs that allows you to draw shapes. So it's a circle. If you click on it once again, it will turn into a square. And my neighbor is apparently doing some uh, do-it-yourself work today. That's a really good idea, I think. Um, so yeah, you can draw shapes. Um, if you want filled shapes, you have to press Control, and that allows you to fill the shapes as well. Yes, very excited baby outside. Very excited. Okay, so yeah, you can draw shapes, you can also draw lines. The line drawing tool blows my mind that we survived without the line drawing tool in a sprite editor for such a long time. But yeah, here we are. Very useful. Just love it. Perfect. Great. So the next uh, update, the next new ability comes here in the, t uh, in the, uh, in the t uh, map editor view. So here are a couple of new things that I th not sure if they were there previously, uh, but the one is definitely new, and uh, that is um, you can move uh, uh, your sprites around in the sprite in a tile map, and the map will be updated accordingly. So, for example, if I want these this vase here, if I want this vase to be somewhere else in my tile, for example, here, right? For some reason, I want to reorganize my tile map. I already drawn some map, I'm going to be like, okay, this vase needs to go somewhere else. I can go Control X. It's mark one surprise to be moved. And I can put it in here, bam. And as you can see, the map has not uh, has not changed. So all the references of different tiles in the map have been updated accordingly. This is very useful. And you can see I, get, I freed up some space here. I can use, um, use the space for something else. You can do this with multiple tiles as well. Uh, so for example, you can go like, uh, if you press shift and then draw a rectangle, you can select multiple tiles. You can go Control X, and you can go Control V. Something that is fun that I'm not sure if it was there before is you can um, you use the same thing to select multiple tiles and draw with multiple tiles. 
I'm not sure if that was there previously, but I love it. Yeah, you can like stamp out parts of your tile map into the map, which, ooh, really cool stuff if you're working a lot with the map. Um, something I would warn you about is that currently in the I version, undo doesn't really work well with this. So if I undo this, so nothing uh, left to undo anymore, but as you can see the uh, I, my, my tile map has been has been changed and actually some of the vases are missing now. So yeah, be careful about using undo with this kind of stuff because you can mess up everything if you do the wrong thing. Hopefully this will get updated soon and this part will become irrelevant. So the next feature comes here in a music editor and that is a completely new view of the patterns in a music editor. So um, so here, here's the usual, the usual pattern editor where you can, you know, assemble three different sound effects into a pattern and then, you know, create all the music loops and so forth. But now there's this button here. If you press that, amazing stuff will happen. <gasps> And so this is a, an overview of all of the patterns that are there. You can see we have 64 patterns and these are all the pa patterns that are used here. This is, I think, pork, uh, pork like. Um, and so you can see like, okay, this is this is this loop and this is this loop. You can actually, uh, at the roundings of the different uh, icons, you can see where there is a loop beginning and end. And as you play the loops, you can see that, you know, the color changes indicating, I think, whether uh, something was already changed or not. Yeah, the green part means that this is where we're go gonna go jump back to at the end of the loop, I think. So yeah, this is great. Um, something you can do here, and that's exciting, is you can copy parts, you can copy patterns into different pa um, places. So you can go Control X to copy something and V to paste it in. You can even multiply it and so forth. So this is really nice. You cannot delete it, but you can go Control X to just basically cut it out. And there is a switch over here between patterns and sound effects. So now you can see the sound effects. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's, that's exciting. Um, the weird thing is that we are still in pattern view, so we are not actually looking at sound effects, we're looking at patterns. Uh, so, like, if I click somewhere, if I double click somewhere, I can play that sound effect. But uh, if I press space, I am actually playing the patterns over, uh, here on top of the screen. So now I'm playing this pattern and you can see which sound effects are playing. You can still move sound effects here. So you can go Control X, Control V, Control X, Control V. So you can move it around and delete them. So this is really useful. This is a godsend, um, especially in here in Park Lake. I've been working with a musician. And when you're working with a musician, you really have to like communicate a lot, you know, which of the different sound effect slots are used for sound effects and which of the one of them are used for music. You're like imagine the musician is working in the background and making your music and you are working on the game and making your sound effects, and then you want to merge the two projects and you realize, oh no, we both have used sound effect 22 for music and a sound effect. And now we kind of have to like disentangle this and this it was like the nightmare previously. But now we can easily just open up a Pico 8 file and move the sound effects around. And all of the music that is associated with the sound effects is also not disrupted. All the patterns are not disrupted. The music just plays, plays normally. Perfect, I love it so much. Uh, I have to say, this is not quite as um, refined yet. Uh, I'm still having problems copying things. So if you go Control uh, Control C, you, it says copied sound effect, but it actually, like from my experience, you cannot copy sound effects between cards like this. Uh, what you what you can copy is like entire patterns, or maybe something didn't quite work as I expected. I had problems copying stuff between cards. So that's something that's not quite, uh, not quite uh, perfectly ironed out here. Still, I really love this view. I really love that we have like this, you know, uh, top-down view on an entire collection of a lot of sound effects, and we can move things around. This has been really necessary uh, to have this kind of um, uh, interface here, and I'm really appreciating that we have this now. Perfect. Now, at this point, I also wanted to point out this tool. So this is actually a cart made uh, by uh, Rune. 
and it's called Renoiser. And that has been posted shortly before the beta came out, which actually has a lot of the features of the beta of this of this new sound effect uh, thing. But I think it's a bit more capable and more practical in some senses. So I hope like some of the features from the Renoiser will be eventually rolled back into into Pico 8. Uh, just like to explain to you, so this is a card that you load in Pico 8, and that card allows you allows like it accesses other cards. It is basically a sound editing tool in Pico 8 that, that you can use to edit other, other cards. And so, yeah, you have a very similar view as you have like currently in Pico 8. So you can see all the, all the different patterns, for example, here. Uh, it's a different card that I loaded here, but yeah, you can see like the, uh, yeah. You can see the music being played and the different sound effects and so forth. Uh, I'm not sure you cannot, uh, you can't move them around here. I think uh, you definitely can move around um, the the sound effects here. And something that I really like um, uh, with Renoiser is that in for example in this view, you can see which of the sound effects are used by music and which on the sound effects are just like standalone sound effects. So for so all of the purple background sound effects are part of the music. And these sound effects are just like freestanding sound effects, I think. Oh no, these are down here, the sound effects, uh, without any background. The blue ones are just not part of the currently selected pattern. So as I click all the different patterns, so this is a very huge sound effect, uh, a very huge music part, and that uses all of those sound effects. And these blue sound effects here are different, whoops, uh, different new, uh, um, pieces of music from belonging to different patterns. And these without the blue and background are just uh, standalone sound effects. And this also, this tool also allows you to copy individual sound effects, but also entire patterns between cards as well. So uh, if uh, somehow the regular Pico 8 stuff doesn't do it for you, you can uh, fall back to this tool. I've been testing it, it's excellent. Check it out, link is gonna be in the doobly-doo. Anyways, back on track. So, um, there are a couple of new fonts possibilities now, which is really exciting. So we have, uh, uh, let's start with, uh, with the more regular one. So do you have, you know, we have like this font, which is like this uppercase font. We used to have, we used to use the, only this one, but there always has been a lowercase font that was kind of hidden and you had to kind of like mess around to access this. Now you, it's kind of like, it has become official. So control P, uh, it tells you it's activated puny font mode. So uh, now you can uh, write lowercase font, I guess. Like, it's not really lowercase, it's just a little smaller. And if you press shift, it be, you get the uppercase one. So, you know, uh, hello is uh, uh, this me you are looking for capitalized, you know, and so forth. Um, so this is nice. Uh, and then again, control P switches you back to the normal mode where there is no uppercase and lowercase. There's just like this, this uh, um, normal font. In addition to this, we also have Japanese katakana and hiragana characters. So if you go uh, control K, you get katakana mode. And now you just mm, write them in, uh, in Romanji and it will automatically get translated to katakana. If you, know, know, if you don't know what I'm talking about, that's fine. <laughs> It's only, I think, for, for people who are familiar with Japanese characters. But yeah, you, now you can, for example, go Akira, which is, you know, Akira, the movie. And it's spelled in katakana on the poster. And you can replicate this in Pico 8 now. Uh, same thing with hiragana, that's J, so control J uh, activates hiragana mode. And now it's the same with hiragana, so um, uh, Akachan. No, which is baby. <laughs> uh, mm, hiragana is kind of like, mm, I'm, I'm struggling to read the hiragana, but the katakana looks fine. Uh, and I think like the, it's the fact that we have new fonts uh, is really nice because we have like more visual data we can use for like tweet cards and stuff like that to generate imagery without having to load any sprites and so forth. So that's already really cool. And also really good for Chinese people who just, uh, Chinese, Japanese people who want to uh, write their, you know, write their games in Japanese. That's really great. Ah, part of the character set um, stuff is also we have like, I think two new functions. I'm not sure if one of them maybe exist before. So we can go chur um, 97, for example. Uh, let's print this out. Uh, that's an A, and if you print a different type of... So each character has a number associated with it, 
and you can find out which character is associated with number by using the new function called char or char, I guess. And you can do also the reverse. You can look up which the number is associated with a character by, um, by going ord. So if you really want to know what is a heart, a heart is 135. Uh, so yeah, so you, you can like, like translate individual characters into numbers and numbers into characters. I think this is really useful. Um, I think this will be really nice. I'm, I'm not sure if this was already there, there before, but I think you can like also encode uh, like numbers or uh, compress numbers into like um, strings of characters now really easily. There's a lot you can do with this kind of stuff, and I'm really excited that it is now so official. Now, something I've been uh, also also uh, using this all this time, but you don't really see here, is there is also now a possibility to visualize tabs. Uh, with or indents because you use tabs for indents with uh, like a like a you know pipe character. So if you go like uh, function uh, draw tab, you can see the tab is now indicated with a with a with a pipe character. So this is how it looks in a in a fully written code. You can see like all of the indentations are now indicated by pipe characters. This is off by default. So you actually have to go to the config file. All right, so there's a config file and you have to go in here um, to draw tabs as characters, draw tabs. You have to change this from zero to one and then you restart pq8 and then that, that will show up, uh, which means that I will probably won't use it in my tutorials because I, in my tutorials I want to, uh, I prefer to use like a, a default uh, configuration of PQ8 so people don't ask, you know, hey, wait, why, why does your PQ8 look different from mine? But yeah, it's, um, you know, it's still, um, it's still a possibility here. I was really excited about this, but now that it's there, I'm not, I'm kind of like, ah, oh, okay. Uh, I'm probably not going to use it. Um, the, my, the main problem I have here is that tabs in PQ8 in standard are just one width, uh, one tile, one character. And that um, kind of defeats the purpose of having those lines. I think if you use a wider tab spacing, you set the tab width to two or three or so forth, that becomes a much more interesting option. I think it's just like a really nice option to customize the look of your uh, Pico 8 uh, text editor. Um, but yeah, there it is. While we're on that, by the way, while we're talking about tabs, there's a whole different type of tabs that are also have been changed or added. So now you have, can add more tabs to your program. So we have six tabs in here, but you can now more, more. And then you gotta go more and more and more and more. And then you, once you get to the double digits, it, it turns into a hexadecimal. I think 16 is the number of tabs you can have now, which, oh, as a tab enthusiast, this is really nice because it allows you to structure a code so much easier. I love it. And now you can see if there's more tabs than the default eight, you can you have like this indication here um, showing you that there's more happening here. Love it. One interesting feature that we have here that has been also mentioned is the so-called activity log. Uh, so I'm going to pull up this. It is the same. It is in the same directory that you will find the config file as well. Um, so what it does here is like a text file that is being generated automatically as you use Pico 8 and it shows you like you now which um, which cards you opened and then there is like the sequence of strings. So I think every three minutes or so it logs or, or three seconds. Let me look it up. Every 30 seconds, it checks what um, what mode you're in, you know, what what kind of part of the Pico 8 editor you're using, and it uses and inserts a letter here for the different different uh, different uh, parts of Pico 8. So you can see which part of the uh, of Pico 8 you've been spending how much time in. Uh, you can basically uh, uh, track the entire development of the program and see how much time you invested in in uh, drawing the sprites, how much time you invested in making the sound effects and so forth. Uh, really useful. Uh, there is, it's just like a text file right now at this point. There is no tools to um, visualize this, but I think we're gonna uh, see uh, some tools from the community popping up where people will visualize them so in a useful way, maybe, maybe do some kind of graphs or you know do some kind of cool uh, information design to make this information more palpable. Really nice. No, but actually I, um, I wanted to load up this one. This is the, my old breakout game here. Let me, there we go. 
So I want to load up this old game because there's a new thing here happening here as well, which is the CPU widget. So Control P will open up this um, CPU usage indicator that is built into BQ8 now. So you can see you know how well your game is performing here. So you can see we're running at a really comfortable 60 frames per second. There's really no problem here. Um, so uh, you see 60, the frame rate 60 from 60 frames per second, so there's no frame skips happening. Uh, the two numbers on the right are um, uh, the CPU usage. So if that reaches one, you start skipping frames. Uh, but now we're using 20% you know, of the CPU right now, so everything is fine. There's two numbers here. I'm I'm not sure why there's two numbers. I think one of the there's like stats one and stats zero. Uh, sets, sets one and set two. One is the CPU usage. Um, um, it gets complicated. You have to get well, like into very you know in depth in depth descriptions of how Pico eight do use simulate CPUs. But there's like two different ways of measuring this, and I think one is like with Lua functions and one is without Lua functions. Whatever. Um, yeah, if you can like elaborate on this, if you know how this works, uh, you can do a write up in the comment section. I would really appreciate to somebody like, you know, explaining to this to me like I'm five because I am. Now, one of the reasons why I've um, loaded up um, the breakout tutorial here or the breakout um, game is now that you also actually have um, a, like a debugging mode right now. Let me show you what I mean. So let's um, disable the CPU thing. So let's say I want to, um, you know, when I'm when I'm playing this game, you see there's like animations, right? Let's say I want to like, there's lots of happening here. Let's say I want to see how this looks like. What exactly happens when the ball collides with the with the brick? Well, I press Escape, which usually ends the program, but now you can continue frame advance the program by just writing a dot, dot enter. It will render the next frame. You're, the program is still loaded. It's still running, you just interrupted it. And now you can frame advance the collision and the animations happening here. Isn't that amazing? And you can even go um, like print out debug information now. So you can go like print ball SPD one. This is, blows my mind that, that I mean, it's it's a basically a whole new debugging tool. Previously, I would have to record a GIF and then load that GIF into Photoshop and like to see what's happening here. So the fact that we have this tool now is really useful. And the cool thing is like, if you have figured something out, you can just uh, resume and the game resumes. This is really great. So yeah, this um, people have been really complaining that Pico 8 doesn't really have a lot of um, debugging tools, but I think like this is kind of like an example of debugging tools kind of like being reintroduced some, some in many ways to Pico 8. And I think to some extent it was always there. It's just like the frame advance new is a new one and resume of also like not really well implemented before. It's just like now being like finalized and so forth. Oh, really good. What happened? We are going deeper into the depths of this new update. Now we're getting to the code stuff. But before we do, there's one last thing that I'm really excited about. If you're at this point, you can go Shift Enter. It will automatically insert an end and insert a tab. So it's con correctly in in indented and you can start writing the function. It not, doesn't just work with functions, also it works with any kind of statement that has an end at the end. Really good. It will take me a while to get used to it, but um, it will speed up a little bit and it will also take a while to unlearn it later on when I move from Pico 8 to other, uh, to other editors. But alas, we are now going into the depths, into the actual programming stuff of the new update. There's some exciting little things here and this next part is... Mm, a lot of people are understandably incredibly excited about this new function. T-line is this new function, this is what it's called. T-line means textured line. Why are people excited about this? Well, um, 
there's some problem here. Oh, there's one end to end. I, I had to undo some stuff. Anyway, we're drawing a line. You are already familiar with this. You know how this works. You can change the color of the line with the last uh, number. It just specifies the co color of the entire line. But what if we want to change the number, the, change the number color of the line as we're drawing the line. As we are moving along the line, we want to make you know, the color, um, to, um, change the color to a different color. How would we do that? Well, here's where T-line comes in. So what T-line does is, I already did some experiments here. So what T-line does here, it, it, it takes, it uses the map, not the sprite map. Not the uh, not this not this not this stuff here. Not the not the sprites, but the actual map. There were the level, so to speak. Uh, to um, and it samples colors from the map, uh, and it changes the to the the color of the line as it's drawing the line pixel by pixel. Uh, so the way this works, we're gonna change change the line in the T line, and at the end, it's not just no longer just one number that we specify, but it's two numbers. Those two numbers, I'm going to put them in their own line because they're kind of like special here, right? They are, uh, let's call them source coordinates. Uh, let's abbreviate it with SRC coordinates. They indicate uh, where on the map we're starting to sample colors from for our map. So if you run this, uh, for our um, line, so if you run this, you see, aha. Uh -huh, our line is colored. It no longer goes all the way to, to the other part of the screen because, well, we only have like, you know, these four tiles here and then it turns black. Then equally here we have like four different colors and there are some patterns happening and then all, all black. It basically samples the top row of the pixels on this, on this map. The top row. One important thing to note is that these numbers uh, for the source, just for the source, are not measured in pixels. They are measured in tiles. So if I change it to one, nothing actually changes. Well, actually, it does change. If I change the y coordinate to one, uh, you will see it looks the same. And if I change it to two, it still looks the same. In order to make it um, actually go per pixel, not because you know what we actually did is you know we jumped from this row, from this entire we, yes, from this row, we jumped to this row and to this row, right? We just like jumped an entire tile always. In order to jump in individual pixels, you have to go like divide by eight, and that uh, still looks the same, but now it looks different, right? So now we went two pixels down, two divided by eight. We have to divide by eight to get from tiles into the uh, pixels because each tile is eight pixels in size. All right. Why are people excited about this? This doesn't seem so great. Well, let's draw more lines. We can do that. Oh, by the way, huh, no, actually I couldn't do that now. Um, anyways, no, that doesn't matter. This is my, my brain. Um, so now I've, uh, we're drawing 16 lines and of course uh, we're drawing them all on top of each other. So in order to spread them apart, we're going to add an I to the Y coordinates. By the way, before we do that, I just want to clarify that uh, the line that you're drawing can be go in any direction, obviously, and it won't affect the direction in which you're sampling. So we're sampling the texture going from left to right. We start here and go over here, right, like this. Um, that's how we're sampling texture, but just just the upper upper row of this of this um, of these tiles. Um, but our tile, but our line, actual line that we're drawing is go, can go in any direction. It can also go in a different direction. We'll start with red pixels and continue uh, in, in whatever direction you're going. Okay, so let's go back to our example. So we can now add the plus i here. So we're now drawing multiple lines underneath each, each other, and this might be become clearer if we go, right? We just like, okay, these are just multiple lines that we draw that are underneath, each other, underneath each other. So it looks like a block. But it's the same line that we're drawing over and over again. So um, what we want to maybe do here is to change the sampling coordinates as we go, as we're drawing the next line. So we're kind of like moving the sampling coordinates with the lines that we're drawing. 
So that's something we can do here. And as I already showcased, uh, just putting the I here won't work. You have to divide by eight to get to the pixel coordinates. So now you can see, aha, uh -huh, we're basically copying the map here. And you can tell that, that's why I had like these kind of weird things at the beginning. Because if we change kind of like some stuff here and we can change the maps here, like something like this, right? You can see we copied, we're basically copying the map onto the screen. And now we basically recreated map. Great, wow. Mm. We recreated the map function where we can draw the map on the screen. Yay! <laughs> okay, that doesn't, that, that maybe is not that exciting for now, but you can do things here now. There's, there's a point to, to my madness. So uh, there's two more uh, arguments that we can deliver that we can add to this. The following two variables, uh, arguments, are the increments. Uh, sorry, see, increments. So this means in which direction, how far are we moving along the map after each individual pixel of the, of the line has been drawn? How far are we moving? In which direction are we moving on the map, on, on, on this here, on the map, uh, to sample the next pixel of our, of our, um, of our line? And as you can see, that these are standard values. Um, oh, wait, not 0 0.1.8. Oops. Uh, ah, of course. Sorry. So these are default values. We are we're going, um, because we're going right. But we can also go in a different direction. We can go like this. So now we're sampling downwards. That looks funky. I'm not sure why it looks so funky. Why is it diagonal? Oh yeah, because we're going downwards as well. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, we're going downwards. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. <laughs> It's just a little bit unexpected. You get lots of really fun and unexpected results with this. So yeah, but now we're sampling downwards, right? So that's why the entire the line stays red all, all the way through. And we can also go diagonally. Woo! Right? Um, so yeah, you can you can do fun stuff here. But I'm showcasing this because we kind of also can stretch things. So for example, it's, it's a bit too, too stretchy. Now we stretched the map. We're drawing the map stretched. Oh, okay. So we can draw the map on the screen and we can like change the, um, the translate it basically. But that, that's not the end of it. We can also Uh, stretch it as we're drawing each individual line. Oh. Oh. Oh, right. Right. Are you are you getting are you getting the yes, if we can we can also like start manipulating stuff, we can change the perspective. There is a perspective happening here. There is like a there is a perspective uh, projection happening here. We're projecting the, suddenly the map onto the screen from a certain perspective. And if you continue this thinking, you will arrive at mode 7. Right, mode 7 was like this special, special type of graphic mode that the Super Nintendo had that is responsible for, you know, those beloved Super Nintendo games like uh, Mario Kart or F-Zero. Uh, or like, like in even Super Mario World, there were so interesting uh, sprite rotations happening with uh, with Mode Seven. So um, T line allows us to replicate phenomena <laughs> similar to Mode Seven. Uh, this is something that we are actually have been doing in Pico Eight before already. People have been trying to replicate these kind of effects, but they were always a bit slow and they required like really hacky stuff. And now it's kind of like a <laughs> very basic good implementation of Mode Seven ish effects and more. Uh, I really like about um, T-Line that it's very flexible. It's like this, you don't really see the power of, power of it if you look at, at it at face value, it's just drawing a line, whatever. But it's, 
you can mess around with this to create a lot of really interesting effects and they often rely on you know having textured things that are uh, stretching and, and translating on the screen. Let me show you some things that I found on the forums. Okay, so this is probably the uh, like you know what this is. This is, has been blowing my mind a little bit. So this is from Tresvol Dog, uh, very well known Pico Eight uh, uh, mastermind, and he basically created. Uh, I'm not sure why. I can't, okay, never mind. Uh, he basically created his um, uh, own textured triangle and textured quad function. So we can now basically have a, a software 3D engine in Pico Eight. Not quite, but you know, you can render individual polygons that are textured, so this is really nice. Um, and uh, if you scroll down here, Fred72 also added uh, his own version of that. And he uh, even like compared the speed of which things are going. If you look at this, it, I mean, it looks like a PlayStation, PlayStation 1 era kind of thing. Even down to the weird texture, like some artifacts, the textures are not quite, the perspective is not quite right. You know, that's what's kind of like a side effect of you know, the early 3D accelerated kind of stuff, and there's no bilinear filtering, so it looks very coarse and very grainy. Yeah, that's something that we could do in Pico 8 right now. Uh, of course, um, don't worry, don't get yourself too excited. We are, Pico 8 won't turn into PlayStation 1. Uh, the processing power, I think, is not there. It's would, uh, something that we'll probably, the community will be doing now is like testing the uh, the extent in which we can do 3D stuff, you know, where are the limits as far as um, processing power goes, right? How many polygons can we can we display and so forth. But uh, yeah, it's great. You can do this kind of stuff now. And there's some really, really cool experiments as well here. Mod here posted this, this, this is really fun. So this is a piece of code. You just basically get, get this code out and put it in your game that uses the map. It has to use the map. And then it basically automatically turns that game into a 3D game. <laughs> and the idea is that he replaces the map function with, a, with his own version that kind of draws the map at an angle. Uh, and I think it, there, he also draws with the sprite drawing also works differently. And it's sometimes it's broken and doesn't really work like here. Uh, but otherwise it, it works fantastically well. It's <laughs> kind of surprising how well it works. This is really fun. This is a game, um, Escape from the Squirrel Park by one of my students so it's both really nice to see uh, see this coming up again it's really really cool yeah so if you, you have a game uh, that uses the uh, tiles mm, try it try it if you can um if you can make it 3d automatically like this really fun yeah so i said um, as i said this function will change the face of pico 8 uh, in the next couple of weeks, for sure. People are going to start experimenting. On the Twitter, I see every day new GIFs of people doing fascinating stuff with it. Um, it's nothing new. It's not like, you know, we haven't done these kind of things before, but this has become now a lot more accessible and a lot more legit, so to speak. Um, so yeah, like if you have any cool examples, post them down in the comment sections. Um, we will return to T-Line in, in the future as well. We haven't even touched, you know, the tip of the iceberg. I just wanted to showcase, you know, what how it generally works. Uh, we have to like, I want to, I want to, you know, experiment myself a little bit before I get into the depths and show you like good um, uh, application cases for this. All right, good. Let's move on. All right, so uh, the next. Um, Function is a very simple one. Uh, is uh, the R&D function uh, the random number generator? You know, it used to like you could get a random number. Um, this now also is able to be used differently by um, if you plug in a table. So something you can do now is t equals um, one, two, three, four, five, six, right? Something like this. And you can plug in the T in here. You can plug in the table into the run random function and it will pick a, uh, a random object from that table. Something that we actually used in Pico 8, we actually wrote our own function that does exactly that. Uh, so it's kind of nice that we can just like throw that function away and replace it with like a built-in functionality of doing this. So 
this is already something I'm, I'm using all the time. And it seems like, okay, why would I do that? Why I can just do, I can just use math to do that, right? Uh, it seems like we're not really winning anything. Well, the cool thing is that you can modify um, the distribution of numbers. So for example, you can have a dice where three is way more uh, frequent than six uh, than other numbers. Or you could, for example, something that we use it for, let's say I have five monsters on the screen or some numbers of monsters on the screen. And uh, I want to turn that one of those monsters into a boss monster. It's a very strong monster. Uh, well, now I can just like do random and then the area of the monsters and it will just output the monster. Or something like, um, something that I use it also for is, uh, let's say I have a map and I want to drop uh, mm -hmm. an object somewhere on a free spot on the map. Uh, and you, what you would do previously is like you would just pick random coordinates and see if they're empty and then drop your, your thing on there, which, you know, generates a lot of false results. So you loop a bunch of times, you have to have like a little loop happening there. It's like this whole chunk of code to do something very simple, just to drop something at a random spot. What I had is like an array of all of the free spots and just pick a random entry from that area. <laughs> it was so much easier. Um, so yeah, like for procedural generation, it's really good. For like RPG kind of stuff, it's really good. You have like really good control over random results. And of course, the, those results don't have to be numbers, right? And so you have to kind of go like, no, yes, no, oops, right, right. So you can go uh, output yes or no or whatever. It's good. Really good addition. Next up, something that I wanted to discuss. Um, so there are some bunch of operators, new operators that we have. Um, this is basically, um, there is a bunch of uh, Bitwise operators. We had these in the Pico in a, a port like tutorial, where um, we have operators that, that um, combine numbers on a binary level, and uh, these were previously functions, but they were now turned into their own operators. So this is great, uh, especially for people who are using a lot of binary function, especially for like tweet cards. Uh, things are a lot more shorter, a lot more compact. Uh, and seem a lot more like integrated with Pico 8 rather than using like this weird function. Something that I, when I went into binary operators in Pico 8, I was like confused why I have to use like these weird functions for this, not just like random operator, uh, like specific operators. So this is good. Um, there is an operator here down here. There's also not different operators here. This one is um, very interesting. The backslash operator will uh, divide a number, so it's division but um, with rational numbers, like the, without the comma. So it's basically floors at the same time. So writing this, a backslash b, is the same as floor a divided by b. And this is good because I quite often want to divide and just want to have a floor to result. So yeah, this will save a few tokens here and there. Just really nice. And then these here, again, I'm not using peak too often. So this is going to be more interesting for people who use this a lot. But peak, peak two, and peak four are ways of sampling places in the memory of Pico 8 uh, of different sizes. So peak will get you eight bits, uh, peak two get, will get you 16 bits, and peak four will get you full 32 bits. That's the size of a variable in Pico 8. And all these three have been now turned into like their own operators. There is a nice memetic device here um, because they're like <laughs> seemingly random characters here. Um, but you can see, tell which is which by counting the counting the corners or the edges the, the ends so to speak so like the at sign only has one end the you know the little tail here otherwise everything is like a swirl so that's peak uh, and peak two has two ends so that's the two ends of the diagonal line and the two circles on count obviously and then peak four has four ends so it's like the two ends of the s and uh, two ends of the diagonal one. So there's four ends here. That's why peak four. Little nice memetic device. Um, yeah, nice, nice. If you're using this a lot, this is probably, again, for tweet cards, this is gonna be probably really, really big deal. You can sque squeeze in more functionality and less characters. <laughs> really nice. <laughs> All right, here's some cool new stuff that I like. It's not a big deal, but it kind of, yeah, it's fun. So look at this. So this is a really simple program that draws all the colors on the screen. Uh, it's just basically like a little sprite that I draw on the screen. Uh, and so something that you all often have to do is you want to set some of those colors transparent, obviously. 
So you're gonna, gonna go pal t and I say red is gonna be transparent. Uh, so zero is gonna be true. So red is transparent and let's say orange is transparent as well. So, okay, uh, nine, true, right? Okay, so as you can see, if you have a lot of transparent colors and if you have to like switch them constantly, you will, uh, you have to do a lot of pal t sta statements. Well, now something you can do is you can do it in one go. Bam, look at this. You can now put in binary number, like a number basically, and just like written in binary, but um, by starting a num number with zero B, it you can spell it out in binary number. You can, uh, so you can transmit a bit field into PELT, into PELT transparency, to, um, to control all of the colors with just one number. So you can see, just made eight colors transparent with just one, uh, one uh, one number, one uh, one PAL T uh, execution, and now we can like really modify, you know, which which color is transparent or not with just a single single number. Really cool, really fast. Um, I think we're gonna save a bunch of tokens on a lot of programs with that one, and also you know, like a lot of people who are very. Um, Comfortable with manipulating uh, things on a bit basis. This is going to be really nice. You can do really cool effects with that. Really cool. And then the other one is also you can do uh, also a similar thing with the uh, palette. So in the regular pal, you know how when we want to change the palette, uh, it's also do, you have to do the same thing, right? Where it's like okay, the red is supposed to become a yellow, uh, orange. I mean. So okay, then then and then the orange is supposed to become a red, uh, uh, and then uh, then this has you know, all those pal for it, each color swap. You have to have your own pal statement. Well, now you can do something like this. Now the pal statement accepts an array. You can also dump an array into a pal statement. And each of the entries in an array will define, you know, uh, which colors should be at this position. And it even accepts colors higher than 128 for the, you know, alternate alternate color palette. I have the whole video thing going up here <laughs> explaining how to get more colors would be great. But yeah, this one statement gives you the dark color palette just in one go. And equally, I think this is really useful for people. Like if you have a project and you define it in the beginning of a project, maybe with a like, you know, uh, pixel art. Uh, mock-up. This is the colors I'm going to use throughout my entire program. You can just like one statement, one array defines the entire color palette for the entire program. You don't have to have like a thousand palette statements, you know, weird loops or anything. It's just like one thing, go, wham bam, thank you, man. Uh, also very useful, probably going to uh, uh, look uh, now a second time at my um, color fading function, because also, again, you can fade all the colors with one pulse statement. You don't have to loop anything. Oh, really good, really useful, you know, qual quality of life improvement. I'm, I'm appreciating this a lot. This, this was, uh, I, I haven't even noticed how much I missed this. <laughs> and while we're talking about colors, there's a little uh, detail here I just noticed. So there's, um, you can do an interesting pr type of print now, just little detail here. So if you go print, um, Hello world. And then just one number eight. That behaves like um, previously you would go color eight and then hello world. Right? Um, you use the color statement to change the color of the text and then you print hello world. Now you can do it with just one statement. Uh, and the, what this is when you only supply one number. If you supply two numbers, then it prints hello world at that position. That, that, that means coordinates, not color. If you supply just one number, that means color. And again, the next uh, statement that you print will retain that color. So, hello, yes, this is dog. Uh, it's, it's, it remains red. It's switched to red permanently now. Good. Uh, another little detail: um, you have uh, now an inbuilt in, in function to output numbers in hexadecimal. 
<laughs> note notations. So if you have like, let's say, uh, um, print to str to string uh, and then 16, right? That's gonna be 16. Uh, let me let me highlight this so it's clear. What we're talking about this. Okay, that's 16. If we go print to string 16 comma true, the true, and says we want to have the hexadecimal number, and so we get a hexadecimal number. And so yeah, this is again, this is really useful. Uh, people have been having to bake their own hexadecimal conversion functions previously, but now you can just like do it with a built-in function. Good stuff. Uh, some little details now. Um, color without anything will. Um, this is fun. Color without anything will um, revert the color to uh, gray to six. Uh, previously, it would revert to zero, which mean would make the text disappear. You probably never noticed this because a lot, very few people are actually using color, and very people would use color without any number inside here. But you know, just the default behavior was changed, and I think it's uh, it's one that you can get away with because there's not a lot of cards that are affected by this. If you change the standard behavior, that's okay. Uh, interesting thing is that a lot of functions like color and so forth are now also returning their previous values. Um, so if you change the color. Uh, you will see that underneath Hello World we got the 8 because the color was red, 8. So it printed out the 8 and also changed the color to back to white. So uh, a lot of the, I think there's, I have a list here, camera, cursor, color, pal, pal T, fill, also the fill pattern, clip, uh, they all return a pre previous state. Um, yeah, good. Now the next one is really interesting. So the way lines work the way line works has been a bit updated yet again. You might remember in the previous version, a line uh, with just two variables, just one set of variables, uh, coordinates, one set of coordinates, two variables, um, or arguments, uh, would continue drawing the line from the last pr um, place you drawn the line to. So I have a little loop here to showcase a problem that comes up here now. So this is really good for you when you're drawing, doing something like this. Now we're drawing an ellipse, something that you can't do. Uh, but yeah, we now we draw this little program here and draw an ellipse. Everything is peachy, fine, all right, sweet, wham, bam, thank you, man. Um, the, there is a problem that what happens when you draw a line before somewhere. So we draw the line here, right? So now we draw a line atop the screen and now you see that it, it will go from the last place we draw a line into our ellipse, but we want to skip to our ellipse. We want to like we start drawing ellipse, we want to define the beginning point and then continue drawing from there. And so this creates this awkward situation where, ah, oh God, now we have to go inside the for loop and go like if I, so if this is the first line that we're drawing, then otherwise, you know, and then, okay. And normally we do the line, but if it's the first segment, then we have to define, okay, we have to draw like a dot basically, or something like this. Uh, so then it works, right? But it's like, okay, we had this line, this shorter line uh, statement to kind of simplify these kinds of things. And now we made them more complex because in order to get into this loop where we can continue drawing, from the last position, we have to reset the starting position somehow, and it has to be in this if statement. Um, there is a cool solution for this now. So we can go just line without any statements. That will reset, uh, re reset the starting point. So the next time you have a statement with two coordinates, it will just set the starting point there. Um, basically, line without any uh, parameters will will delete, will make the picker it forget where the last line was drawn, and the next time you draw, start drawing a line like this, uh, you will start defining the points again from scratch. Really nice uh, and makes for really nice clean code. Mwah. Love it. There's some stuff here that I wanted to discuss. Um, yeah, there's some, I, I'm not going to showcase this. I'm not, not using this too much myself, but yeah, there's, um, you have like kind of like default fill patterns. I think this is really nice for, again, tweet cards. But yeah, let's let's get this one. Let's show, showcase this one real quick. Yeah, so if we have this, let's do a CLS there. 
So we have like different fill patterns for um, that you can set up without having to, you know, go to this like weird tool and find out. You can have like hard fill pattern, and you can have. I think some of them are really useful. I think this one, no, no. Where is this? This one is nice because you get like these dotted lines. Or I think ah, the checkboard one is really good. Yeah, this one is also reused really because you use this all the time for all sorts of things. So yeah, it's nice, nice addition. Uh, doesn't like completely revolutionize the world, but it's a, it's a beautiful layer of polish to this entire thing. I love it. Okay, so what else? Um, there we go. A custom uh, repeat delays. So with two um, with two two different pokes, you can uh, let me zoom in a little bit here. So with these, you can set the delay of the key presses. So when you press a key and hold the key, uh, shortly after you press, there's the key won't fire again, right? Because you, when you're typing or something, you don't want to like if you press the key for a longer time, type the same letter multiple times. So after the first press, the key won't re-trigger. And then if you keep pressing, uh, the key goes into like this rapid fire mode and starts start re-triggering after all. Um, and so there is like a, some standard values that Pico 8 was working with, but now you can modify those values if you feel like that the auto fire function doesn't work the way you expect it. Well, you usually write some kind of workaround to kind of like get around the get, get around the standard behavior of um, of Pico 8, but now you can just like modify the standard behavior of Pico 8, and you don't have to write those workarounds. Really nice. I love it. It's uh, it makes sense. It just gives us more ability to customize the behavior of Pico 8 and less. We don't have to, we ha don't have to fight with Pico 8 that much anymore, at least when it comes to this, this part. Another thing I want to discuss here is um, so the, this whole T line is also uh, um, related to this part: the co tokens and code compression. So a lot of the fundamental things about Pico 8 has changed. Uh, one thing is the compression has become a lot better. Uh, and also, like some token calculations are more forgiving. So um, basically, um, Zep went through the compression code and compresses the code of the card into the little image, the little PNG image. And he also found some, you know, space that he wasn't using that he was able to use it for now. So now you can get a lot more, um, a lot more stuff into your card, and that's good. I have some information here, so let me um, pull this up real quick. All right, so this is pork like as you can see this is like the most current version of pork like loaded with um with the newest version of uh, of uh, pico 8 and as you can see i have 170 tokens uh, when i wrote this in older version i had 191 tokens so it's basically i got 21 f tokens for free just by loading it into the new version <laughs> 20 tokens a big deal uh, I mean, I cannot like add a new function with just 20 tokens, but it gives me like a lot of play room if there's any bugs or, you know, if I, maybe I can like tweet some things now. Uh, and, but even more significant is the compression, compressed size. I was really butting against the compressed size, sort of deleting comments and everything. So comments that really hurt me a little bit. And also like I had to rename some variables, which I realized too, too late that they weren't actually doing anything. Um, but yeah, now it's... Um, so it was at 99.98% and now it's down to 82. So again, uh, just giving you more, you more headroom to work with your project. And by the way, if I look at this, see, this can be now one single uh, PAL T statement. So good, so good. I could even save more tokens uh, using these new features. Good stuff. So uh, there's two new feature uh, functions uh, as well that I also want to talk about, uh, which are might be very useful. Uh, so one is uh, they called pack and unpack, uh, and to uh, explain what they do, because I also had to like ask around because I didn't understand what they were doing. So let's say you are drawing a line that looks like this, right? And the line has like a bunch of numbers associated with it. You have to feed line a bunch of numbers to draw this line. Um, what if we could? get those numbers into an array, right? That would be great. Um, but ah, it's um, it's difficult, you know, you, you can get them in, in an array. Let's, let's, let's have an array go like, oh, okay, yes, we could, but uh, we don't actually win anything like this because now you have to go like, okay, T1, T2, T3, 
you know it's 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 very tedious you have to like pull each individual entry from that array uh you know by index and uh it's, we are we're wasting a lot of tokens for this thing you know depending on what we're trying to do it might be worth it but it's not really like okay that's not really that good something you can do now is just go unpack uh t ban <laughs> it basically takes the contents of an array and un unpacks it as a string of arguments that you can drop into a function sweet uh, and so pack the, the reverse does the reverse thing so it just basically takes a bunch of um, um, a bunch of arguments and puts all of those arguments into an array mm, not sure what pack is for um, so you would do like okay let, just let me let me show you how that would look like so you could pack would <laughs> be defined the the array in a different way basically uh, not sure what pack is for if you have a good idea of how to use pack uh, write a comment in the comment section i'm still struggling to find out what to do here unpack is super nice it's super good i can easily imagine um the we have some techniques that we had in a pork like tutorial where we had uh arrays that were compressed uh, into strings. So we had strings that were then exploded into arrays so we could get a lot of information from outside from like a, a Google Docs document, a lot of information into into very few tokens. And now we can just drop that information directly into functions. So it makes for a very, very efficient workflow, very way the information can flow from those strings directly into functions. Uh, I can, like my brain's already a bus with all of the tokens I could save from pork like, but I have to get away from that game. It doesn't good do me good too good to stay too much, <laughs> to work too much in that game. But for future projects, it's excellent. Things can get a, a lot more streamlined this way. Love it. Thank you, Zap. I was, I didn't even knew I, was, I needed this. This is good. All right, so um, next thing uh, I have here on the list is demo cards. There's new uh, demo cards. So if you type in help, you see here install demos. If you do that, uh, it will create a whole folder of demos that you can check out. Uh, CD demos. And they were there before, but now there's new demos. So let me show you, showcase you all of the demos. Cute bunnies. Cellular automata, fractals. Amazing. Bouncing guy. Uh, it's that um, ray casting demo again. Uh, not sure if that changed. Uh, it's that collision detection demo again, but I think now we can pick up stuff and there's a cute bunny. God love that bunny. Yeah, that's that's a look that Zep really loves and I'm here for it. Good old Drippy. Yeah, Jelpy uh, is has got a lot more complex. It's I'm, I haven't been playing it too much, but there's a lot of stuff happening. It, apparently, there's some birds somewhere. If you can tell me how to get the bird, I would be very excited. Not this one. Not this guy. That's not a bird. It's just a bad guy. But yeah, there's uh, there's a uh, there's big level happening here now. Is that the bird? No. No. Like you know you. So this is nice, there's like an empty level here. There's an empty level. Use the map editor to add some blocks and monsters. In the code editor, you can also set level equals two. And yeah, you can set level equals two to get there immediately to start making your own levels for gel people. Uh, it's a sorting algorithm, but with giraffes. Ta-da! Uh, it's a walking simulator with a dog. I think he can eat something, but I'm not sure how. Whoa. So yeah, these are all of the demos. Um, they're really nice. They're well commentated for the most part. And it's really nice, especially gel piece, I think nice to see because it kind of like showcases maybe a bit of a more um, um, how they can be used to teach people to get into Pico 8. Maybe something that will be expanded upon now that we're in a beta and things are supposed to get more user-friendly. Um, I like this. This is good.
Okay, so now uh, wrapping this up and exporting as binaries. What? Ah, there we go. <laughs> What's happening here? Um, export as binaries will also now export as zip files because in some uh, operating systems, in certain cases, like the file attributes are important, and this will just does that automatically and puts it in a zip file, so you don't have to do file attributes yourself. Technical things, but it's just like you know, uh, uh, quality of life improvement again. Uh, there is also an, uh, some improvements to the HTML export. There was used to be a bug. Uh, with one of the menus on the side in Chrome that was of course fixed and I think uh, a lot of, lot of the stuff works a lot faster now in the HTML export. Sadly, uh, the HTML export still is broken on iOS if you upload it to itch.io. So if you upload the HTML file exactly as it is to itch.io and you load that up on an iPhone 6s, the one that I use, <laughs> It will be broken. I think it will be also broken on other iPhones as well. The buttons will just work. We had the same problem previously. I um, contacted Zap. He was working on this, but apparently he thought he fixed it, but it's not fixed. Uh, I will contact him again. So uh, yeah, I will have to still use my own home-baked version for that. I'm not sure. I have also an old uh, uh, iPad. I'm not sure if it works on that. I will let you know in the future. Um, but uh, on a more positive side, there was used to be uh, last version had like this kind of weird include bug, where if you included text files made in Windows uh, and you know the Windows said the text file didn't have to add too many tabs or enter signs or something, it would um, not uh, import correctly, not include correctly. That um, bug was fixed. Uh, all the files that I had problems with are now included properly. So yes, this is good. So yeah, this is Pico 8, uh, the beta version 0.2. Now, if you've been an eagle-eyed listener, uh, you might have um, remembered that there were used to supposed to that was supposed to be a new function happening in the beta, and that was the online scores. Uh, that's something that uh, I was looking forward to, and that didn't appear in this version. So I contacted Zep, asked him what what's up with that, and he said that it's still on the. Uh, it's still on the roadmap. He will add it in throughout the beta some sometime, but just not at the beginning. He just wanted to you know shift down a little bit and make sure that the other things that he wanted to finish up were actually working, and they are working. So this is good. Uh, generally, um, it's a really nice improvement, like a lot of like quality of life kind of stuff, and I'm really excited. I'm really really excited about T line. I think we're gonna see. The repercussions of T lines, you know, down the line, multiple months, is will change the face of P8. I think we're going to see a lot of more 3D experiments P8, and that's going to be really fun. Uh, yeah, it's also like like questions what P8 actually is because it used to be like this NES kind of thing that looks like an NES, but now with T line, we're going to get a lot of cards that are actually more reminiscent of uh, Super Nintendo or even PlayStation One games. Again, it's not going to be like a full 3D, you know environment kind of thing that Pico 8 just doesn't have probably the juice to run a huge kind of like 3D operation. But we're going to see maybe some little 3D effects. I'm thinking about something like Castlevania, um, um, the PlayStation 1 Castlevania, where, you know, everything was 2D, but sometimes you go, you go into a room and suddenly there was like, you know, a cube spinning in 3D. Uh, I think these kinds of effects we're going to might, might see more of in the future. And of course, rotating sprites and, and things like this. Exciting stuff. If I missed something important or if I got something wrong, or if there's something that you want to add to this, post in the comment section. This is really good because this one this is one of those videos that will, people will search for when they're looking for the features for, for uh, of the new version. So if you add your comment downstairs, they will also know about the features that you are excited about. Uh, otherwise, we will be back in the future with some more content. I'm not exactly sure what it will be, but I am cooking on the next tutorial for sure. See you next time around, guys. Bye-bye.